So thank you so much, Toya, and, and uh, great to see so many others here today for this uh, webinar, which is actually the first, uh, it's a sort of, I guess it's a sort of launch of our new article that was published just last week. Uh, and, and this seminar, as our article, uh, is called Three Decades of Climate Mitigation, Why Haven't We Bent the Global Emissions Curve? And I'm just going to be speaking now for about 10 minutes to sort of briefly introduce the the paper um, that we've co-authored, 23 of us. Um, and then I will hand over the floor for some short reflections from my other co-authors on the one sort of, if there is one <laughs> key insight or sort of, um, let's say takeaway that, that you took from, from being a part of writing this article and thinking about these issues over the last year or two. And then after that, we'll have hopefully about an hour for discussion and questions and comments. Um, so that's the sort of the plan, I guess, for this afternoon. Um, and just to say, I mean, the original question, why haven't we bent the global emissions curve, was actually sent uh, to my dear colleague Kevin Anderson, who's here in the room today as well, uh, by a, um, uh, one of the leading co-authors of the upcoming IPCC report, the third working group. Um, and I guess it was uh, stemming from a certain um, um, frustration, maybe, but also sort of an understanding that, that Kevin and others <laughs> Uh, have been critiquing uh, the third working group specifically for some of the, uh, um, let's say, um, the ways in which the climate mitigation challenge has been construed. Uh, and obviously, the question was then if we could write an article about this and, and that could inform the upcoming uh, sixth assessment report, uh, which when it comes to the third working group will come next year. Um, then quickly, I guess Kevin said that he didn't have time for this, so he recruited me to this process of <laughs> Of, uh, of being involved in this and, and also asked me to sort of lead on it. Um, and then Kevin kindly uh, supported me in that process, of course. But quite quickly, when we started you know, uh, delving into this issue and sort of defining some ways of sort of breaking down this, this major big question that's at the core of, of this article that we just published, we realized that, of course, we couldn't do this on our own. Um, so based on the sort of the, the nine um, or 10 at the time, let's say thematic lenses that we developed, which I'll present uh, just shortly, we invited uh, a number of co-authors uh, from a wide variety of disciplines and backgrounds uh, to sort of grapple with this together. Um, so it was very, very much a collaborative interdisciplinary effort. Uh, and I'm very happy that so many uh, of our co-authors are here today as well to share their thoughts uh, on the issue at hand. Uh, so thanks for being here and thanks for all this hard work that you put into this effort over the last year and a half or so. Uh, but just a little bit of a backdrop then. Um, this is a graph from our, uh, from our article um, that uh, provides a sort of, I guess, a quantitative framing that I guess is, is one, one important uh, <laughs> backdrop to, to why we're concerned uh, of this issue at all, why emissions just keep rising uh, despite then decades of international negotiations and um, uh, well, increasingly a large um, uh, body of research uh, informing those negotiations of the dire consequences of, of not decreasing emissions and also a whole swathe of, of climate action over these last 30 years since the question first sort of gained traction on the international agenda. You know, emissions have just uh, continued skyward. Um, emissions today are, uh, carbon emissions today are 60% higher than they were in the 1990s when the first IPCC report came out. Um, and if you look at the sort of amount of emissions that have been released in just this very short time period, it, it, it is more carbon emissions or fossil carbon emissions than have been released previously in history. So we have, we have definitely not been on track to sort of responding to this problem and predicament in a way that, that, uh, that, we, that we should have, of course, and everybody in this room probably knows that uh, already. I guess another thing that we uh, bring to the fore here with this graph is to show the sort of um, distribution of, of these emissions uh, across different countries and, and regions. Um, even though only about 20% of the population uh, reside in the so-called industrialized countries, we can see that um, their emissions, uh, territorial emissions have resulted in, in more than half of the emissions over these past uh, 30 years. And between the yellow section of this graph and the red section of the graph, which is the uh, developed, so-called developing country parties and the, and the so-called developed country parties, we have a thin line, a thin blue line, which
which is the so-called least developed countries where almost a billion people reside and they have obviously almost not at all contributed to this problem if, from a mitigation perspective. Uh, so that's just a little bit of a backdrop. Uh, so how do we then go about um, unpacking this question of how three decades of attempts to mitigate and why the emissions just continue upwards? Um, so we decided to, to develop nine thematic lenses, and this was Kevin and I, I should say, to, that, that began with this, and then we invited authors to, to, um, uh, to write about this from their various disciplines and, and, and areas of expertise. So the first lens was um, what we call international climate governance, and here we had Matthew Stilwell and Joanna De Pledge, um, none of whom are here today, unfortunately, but they looked into uh, issues of international climate governance and um, looked at all sorts of issues, including institutional design, but I guess landed in, in the sort of conclusion that uh, deliberate political strategy has played an incredibly important role in setting the, the uh, scope for possibilities in terms of the outcomes of the international climate governance uh, sphere or regime. Uh, we had Martin Hultmann and Nagme Nasiritusi, both of whom are here today, I guess, I've seen in the participant list. Uh, explore questions of vested interest uh, of the fossil fuel industry. And this ties quite closely into how I ended <laughs> my presentation with the last lens in the sense that uh, obviously through varying lobbying strategies um, um, of both public and private interests, I guess, um, you can see that, um, you know, this has definitely contributed to, to uh, delaying Mitigation, um, but we can also see in the last few years an increased level of, um, let's say, more proactive or, or let's say, um, um, solutionist approaches of, of the sort of oil majors and the hydrocarbon industry in terms of, of, of framing uh, themselves as part of the solution and, and developing net zero strategies, et cetera, et cetera. So more of hedging strategies. Uh, underpinning this, we also explored, um, and this was Andy Sterling and Peter Newell, who's here uh, as well with us today explored the sort of more um, fundamental and I guess long run institutional and normative um, uh, issues that have underpinned, uh, I guess, development for, for long, for long so-called uh, development uh, for long periods of time. And here, um, you know, they explored issues of, of extractivism on the global level and also the geopolitical competition uh, of, over resources. And also questions of the military itself as, as a carbon emitter, but also facilitating sort of wider, um, let's say, um, issues of, of or, or mindsets of control in trying to respond to global challenges such as climate change. And this goes, of course, further back than just 30 years. Uh, it goes all the way back to colonialism and imperialism and, and is today finding new forms of expression in, in green grabs and so-called land grabs. Um, the fourth lens that uh, Clive Spash and Frederick Hash, who both are here as well, uh, I'm glad to say, uh, explored was, was the role that uh, economics and financialization or the finance sector have played in, in um, inhibiting um, wiser responses and more efficient responses to, to the question of climate change. And here they start from uh, looking at the neoclassical sort of framing and the, uh, and the sort of dominance of general equilibrium models in, in trying to understand a super complex and highly political issue such as climate change is. And um, I'm not going to try to capture their, <laughs> their rhetoric in this very short summary, but uh, they, they uh, blow a, a hard punch at the sort of mainstream economists and, and people that are arguing for, I guess, more growth focused uh, and, and market focused uh, responses to, to climate change and climate mitigation. Um, we had um, Wim Carton and also uh, Claire Goff uh, look at the role that specifically mitigation modeling um, and, and not least the integrated assessment models underpinning or dominating the work of the IPCC's third working group have played in potentially um, um, postponing more um, effective mitigation. And here, of course, one of the outcomes that they sort of explore and one that they, they push for here is that there's been a very limited rationale or limited mindset that is focused on technology and economics in responding to uh, climate change rather than a more broader um, sort of understanding of climate change as a social and cultural problem as well. And the sort of the, the impacts that this has had on, on the, the modeling work of the IPCC, but also that is underpinning lots of policymaking and policy decisions today. We had Glenn Peters, uh, who is fortunately not here to, with us today, 
look at the question of energy supply systems um, and um, also identifying the lack of, of a disc or uh, discussions around not only efficiency but also of sufficiency when it comes to the total use of energy and also the lack in both modeling and in thinking around uh, future energy systems, um, the, the lack of attention to specifically not only developing more renewables, but actually actively retiring fossil fuel based infrastructures uh, um, and mindsets as well. Um, then we had a seventh lens, we're almost through, only two more lenses to go after this one. I hope you're still with, with me in this. Um, we had um, uh, both Shivan Karta and um, also Sonia Kalinsky look at issues of inequity. Um, obviously, as I sh showed in the beginning, you know, the uneven distributions of, of emissions is, is a huge issue when it comes to uh, when it comes to responding, you know, to, to climate change. But there's also, which they try to identify in this in this lens, um, um, certain dynamics of inequity that also perhaps are at play that separate the wealthy from the poorer, that undermine the, uh, the possibility of more collective action on climate change and climate mitigation, and also entrenches uh, uh, a form of status quo um, um, that the elites of our world, of course, um, in different ways might prefer. And this is, connects quite closely to an eighth lens that we looked at, which was the role that high carbon lifestyles um, uh, and social practices as they're known, and also behaviors have played in, in undermining action for, um, um, for bringing down emissions. And I guess one thing they discuss in this lens is how uh, uh, both this, these issues both have social but also material aspects. Uh, so they're both uh, built into our the ways that we have built our societies, and uh, but also the, in our in our way of thinking around this, specifically people that have obviously uh, normalized high carbon lifestyles. Um, and this was um, both Claire Hulohan, I think, is with us today, uh, and also Stuart Capstick, who's unfortunately had to uh, well had other um, things that came in the way, so he's not with us. But we have Claire here, so I'm very happy that you're here, Claire. Um, and then a ninth uh, and final uh, lens that we looked at was um, what we call social imaginaries, or uh, you could quickly or maybe simply talk about them as collective images of how we might live or how society might develop. And here we had Magdalena Kushler and also um, um, uh, Terry Facer um, looking at these issues and how uh, we have a very limited, specifically maybe in carbon intensive and energy intense societies, we have a very limited capacity to imagine a future beyond um, the fossil fuel based um, societies that we have today. And that alternatives to this are, have been actively marginalized in history and, and, and today as well. And, and think about also how institutions such as the university is, is, uh, is also playing its part in this. And without, I'm realizing I've, it always takes longer to speak about things than you plan. So I'm gonna, just say one last thing here. Uh, there's, of course, many things that came out of this analysis, and I, some of my co-authors, I think, will be able to share some thoughts on this as well in, in a better way than I can. But one of the common threads that that uh, Kevin and I, who were sort of kind of bringing this together, but also um, the the four other, uh, three other authors, or four other authors that were part of sort of trying to synthesize this, which was Nicholas Hallstrom, Yuba Sukona, Mariama Williams, and Eva Blöbrand. One of the things that we sort of found uh, in this was the common thread of, thread of power um, underpinning all of these analysis and power manifested in very different forms. So the first uh, form <laughs> we sort of caricature here as uh, the Davos cluster, which is a sort of a form of sort of raw institutional, um, um, I guess, instrument, institutional form of power that's embedded in our institutions and our way of thinking and specifically among certain uh, communities, I guess. Um, and then the second form of power that was maybe captured more by, uh, let's say, uh, the expert community or the academics that are involved in these issues, uh, we, we caricaturize this, caricaturize this form of power, uh, sort of knowledge as power, as, as the enablers. So uh, um, experts and academics and others that are, are, are in different ways involved in producing uh, knowledge around this issue that you they have actively uh, in a sense, or we have actively enabled um, or constrained the ways in which we, we think about possible uh, responses to the question of climate change. 
Um, and that was captured in these sort of three lenses specifically. And the last sort of uh, cluster of, 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 of power, I guess, that we tried to um, create images for here is, is, the, is that image of an ostrich sticking its head in its sand uh, and comfortably, or <laughs> comfortably not uh, taking in the issue at hand for various reasons, but also um, the possibility of, of really reimagining, you know, what direction our societies could take in the face of climate disruption. Uh, and here it captured sort of by uh, the mythical image of, of the phoenix that is reborn out of the ashes of its predecessor. Um, so I guess in this, this um, last cluster of, of, of power is, is the sort of the real, the, the, really the power of ideas and also the power of um, the power of the example, I guess, as well, and, and, and how, how setting example for, for a different trajectory can really shift things. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. There's hopefully that's Toya. Well, maybe you'll 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 berate me for being too um, too complex in my choice of words. Maybe my uh, co-authors uh, will be a little bit better at trying to communicate some of their thoughts on on what they really gained from uh, or one of the key takeaways, I guess, from from uh, being a part of writing this paper. And since we have quite a few of you here, I guess. I would ask you to initially, so we have time for a discussion and questions. If you just try to keep your reflection to under a minute, I would uh, I really appreciate that. Um, and I will just hand over to, um, see here, I'll stop sharing my screen to begin with. Um, and hand over, I guess, um, to, maybe we'll start with, um, Let's go in my list here. Maybe we'll start with uh, Peter Newell, if that's okay. Okay, yeah, thanks very much, Isaac. That was a great overview of uh, a big piece of work that took a long time, but was great to, great fun to be involved with. Um, I guess for me, the, the thing that struck me is just how interrelated all the different parts of the puzzle are. Um, I mean, the way you just described it there about power being central to, to all of this, I think that's absolutely right. The way I read the geopolitics, the interstate nature of this, the vested interests, the in inequity, the lifestyles, all of these things are intimately interconnected. They involve different forms of power, but they're all part of the same explanation in a way. And I guess that was one of the things that struck me as we went through the process of writing this and hearing about what other people were con contributing. And I guess for me, that's an antidote in terms of the broader debate to this idea that we're somehow all in this together. Um, as we're about to find out at the uh, COP summit, I suspect mm -hmm. what this paper highlights is the sort of the intrinsic conflictual um, and unequal nature of climate change and and of course, not just the nature of the phenomena itself, but the ways in which we're responding to it socially and politically and the injustices that, that run through it. So the contribution Andy Sterling, who can't be here and I made was to really focus on what we argue is the neglected role of, of the military, both as, um, as a polluter in and of itself, so actively contributing to our failure to bend the emissions curve, uh, but also as an active shaper of energy pathways, more centralized ones and more technologically focused ones, and particularly around things like uh, nuclear power, but also as a promoter of uh, technological fixes as a way of getting out of some of these problems and a big emphasis on, on geoengineering. Um, as well as positioning themselves as a, as a hugely powerful actor in resolving climate insecurity, but in the process often exacerbating climate insecurity at the same time. So I'll try and wrap up there. We've only got one minute. I guess for me, then, the whole, the whole thing is about how power <laughs> runs through all of the different things we're talking about. And for me, that was the, the interesting thing going through this process was looking at the ways in which it's manifested and interrelated across all of these different sites that we look at in the paper. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, Martin, would you, Martin Hultman, would you like to uh, chip in with a few reflections? Uh, yes, please. Thank you, Isaac. Yeah, it was great to be part of this. Uh, I think of it not even as interdisciplinary scholarship, but uh, maybe super disciplinary or maybe undisciplined even because we actually brought together the knowledge is not staying within our discipline. So that was really exciting work. I think we showed uh, that this double meaning of power, both as energy and as dominance uh, or various forms of dominance uh, is very much part. Uh, so this double form of, of power, I think, uh, 
we, we talk about much in, in, in the paper. But what I actually took away was uh, an incentive and motivation to think about what do we do now then? Uh, okay, what, what, what can be the ways forward? And um, one aspect that we didn't really make, that didn't really make it to the paper is gender issues. And I think that we've connected to power as well. So how can we explicitly those that are super emitters or super spreaders? Uh, so, so changing uh, not least masculine and norms uh, there I think is, is important. And also laws, uh, how can we change the laws to actually support the mitigation that we need? And the universities, as you mentioned, um, Isaac, I've also been thinking with that. So uh, for me, this collaboration also informed me and motivated me and inspired me to think further what to do next. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, thanks for those reflections. I think we'll pass over to Nagme then, who, who is um, your partner in crime, <laughs> Martin. Nagme. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, I want to echo the previous speakers. It was a fantastic experience. <clears throat> and for me, the most interesting thing was coming from all these different disciplines, how much we actually agree what the main problems are. Uh, and this is because, I mean, uh, climate change is because we've followed uh, a development pathway that builds on fossil fuels and uh, resource extraction and that this is very difficult to change. Um, so just uh, agreeing so much between us, I think, was really useful. Thanks. Thanks, Nagme. Um, I think we'll uh, pass on then to uh, Clive, Professor Spesh. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so uh, you can hear me okay, can you? How is it? Yeah, okay. So for me, the thing is, uh, when I look at a paper like this, is, um, is actually the elements that can unify the knowledge comes to my mind. And for me, bringing together, so people say, you know, we have commonalities here, uh, but it's the, the elements that would bring this into, uh, into a, more of a focus. So, you know, working in economics, clearly economics is a total failure, mainstream economics. And it's, uh, it, but it's a big success in terms of supporting capitalism and actually in preventing uh, anything being done on climate change. As a science, it's a total failure because it has nothing to do with reality in the sense of, the, of what it's trying to, uh, trying to purvey about the, the economy, which is capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. so there are many economies, there's not one. And uh, this is the denial of potentiality. But for, the, for me on the paper, it's about the structure that we, we hold in common as being uh, at issue here. So capital accumulating economies, you know, China is just as bad as America in this regard. Uh, you know, it's state controlled capital accumulating economies with massive amount of energy and, and material throughput. Uh, these, this is very, very problematic. It's the common element. Militarized, of course, it's militarized, you know, because these go hand in hand. And there's no such thing as a GDP country that hasn't got a massive military. They, they, they like correlate almost perfectly. Uh, and this is, of course, the development model. So these are all commonalities that we have, then we need a common theory, right? This is the thing where I would, um, when I see, when we talk about lenses, you know, I always, I, I have a slight worry about that because for me, it's not just lenses, it's the commonality. Okay, we're looking at elements, but we're looking at a common structure and there's a commonality here. It's not like we all have different lenses from different, why, why do we all agree? Because we're looking at the same structure. It's a real structure. And the real structure in terms of all these different various social sciences coming together is that we're, we're actually describing the mechanisms that are preventing people acting on climate change. And there are multiple mechanisms. They're in the single one. It's not just the Davos elite or, or the failure of the economists or uh, you know, various other things, or your bad politicians and stupid people like Trump or whoever, you know, or the Republicans or the Democrats or whoever it might be happens to be in control or the Chinese authoritarian state system. There's multiple mechanisms, and that's what we're pointing out in the paper, I think, is that you're identifying these mechanisms, and then to address the mitigation problem is about how you counter those mechanisms, which I think is only just being started. I mean, at the end of the paper, we start raising questions about how do you counter the mechanisms that have been identified. Thanks. Thanks, Clive. Um, I think we'll pass on to Frederick, who uh, co-wrote your section with you, Clive. Frederick. 
Thank you, Isaac. Uh, yes, I mean, for my part as well, it was really fascinating to see a common uh, strand emerge about the role of power, because it certainly corroborates what I see in my area. Uh, I mean, where I witnessed the ever increasing role of uh, markets, carbon markets, despite 15 years of failure. And I see that, for example, in the current EU ETS review that forces a greater role for uh, offset still leaves no real cap um, beyond our remaining carbon budget. And we see that also in the COP26 agenda, which is really first and I mean, to a large extent about creating a new carbon offset market and about negotiating how much cheating to allow. And all of this is not really important because as I see, as I understand it in my area, the goal is not really, is only to address climate change in so far as it does not challenge economic growth and vested interest. And in fact, this corroborates many conversations that I had with um, members of uh, permanent representation in the EU from UK, France, et cetera, and to lobbyists that everybody agrees that these markets are never meant to work and will never work, but that is not the goal. And so it was really, as Clive said, uh, much better than I did. Interesting to see that everybody reaches somehow the same conclusion about it's not a lack of awareness, it's not a lack of solutions, but it's about power ultimately. Thanks, Frederick. Um, Claire Huluhan, are you there? I am, yeah, I'm here. Um, I think I kind of, my reflections echo others have said here. So I, I think I was not surprised, but delighted to see sort of commonalities in the, the discussions that we all presented. And the way that these kind of recur across different disciplines and in different research communities is really interesting. I say I'm not surprised by that. I think others have covered this it's because we're all looking at similar things in similar ways. And it's it's about these underlying power dynamics and structural conditions uh, that shape the, the what we're looking at. But I think what's interesting about this is it really kind of signals how much work is needed to avoid this sort of fixation on a single solution or some sort of silver bullet towards climate change and actually consider what what's needed from policy and what's needed from climate action to meaningfully draw on all these different insights that we have. Now, we don't always agree, you know, Stu and I are a psychologist and sociologist. So if you want a definition on how we don't always agree about the things that we were discussing, it's a really nice example. But the point is that policy needs to reflect those kinds of nuances and those complexities in what we're dealing and be sim similar, similarly complex, similarly nuanced in its approach to uh, climate change if we want it to be effective. I think that's all from me. Thank you, Claire. Um, so we have two last reflections here, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, and that's from two of my colleagues that were part of sort of uh, writing the synthesis more and trying to bring this all together. So I'll ask uh, Nicholas first, if you're, if you're there, if you'd like to share some thoughts. Sure, thanks, Cisak, and sorry for joining in a little late here. Um, but I can just echo what everybody says. This was a super fascinating process. I'm very, very happy to have gotten to work with you all and, and to see also Isaac shepherd this, this crowd in such a beautiful way was also a retreat. Um, and, um, and I think also working with Isaac in trying to particularly see how to kind of make sense and frame this and, and you know, dealing with these clusters of issues at, at meta levels and, and, and thinking about these sort of um, areas as almost entities and then realizing how that is also difficult was really kind of a, a interesting kind of brain exercise. But I think it also is really interesting too, I think some others said that, you know, how I, this, this kind of endeavor makes you see how limited we are in, in our concepts, how we are entrenched, even though we try to be critical and, and progressive and so on in a, in a sort of very deep mindset that we, we all have to kind of break out of it. And, and I think that the whole notion around development progress, uh, the sort of underlying deeper structures that we're, we're, we're very much shaped by, uh, whether we would like it or not, is, is, is really the down underplaying. To me, that's, that's, be, that, that's even more than power as a theme. We're still stuck here. And, and, and I think it would be really interesting to, to kind of see this exercise with, you know, a parallel exercise perhaps with folks that were also dominantly coming from non-Western societies. That, I think that was the sort of the, the 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 limit we had in our group and and um, and uh, uh, really to uh, to get to the the core of 
of really that idea of, of development and progress, I think, is, is what this opens up for uh, in some un, un, sort of spoken way, perhaps. Um, and uh, but also very hands on, I think, uh, the, the everybody talking about COP26 is going to be a, a, a crazy, terrible uh, focus now on net zero uh, uh, illusions as, as, as solutions. And, and I think this paper is giving some some good good uh, hands-on tools also to debunk those kinds of false games. So um, much to say, this paper is, I think that's what it's supposed to do, raise a whole lot of conversations. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Nicholas. We, we, we're not pretending to have a compre comprehensive <laughs> uh, uh, description of, of the problem, although we, we try it, I guess. Um, so last but not least, I'd like to hand over to my dear colleague, Kevin Anderson, who has really been leading on this together with me. So we've had lots and lots of late nights and <laughs> and and uh, sending uh, texts back and forth over these last year and a half. So Kevin, what, what would you like to add to what's already been said so far? Um, two, two things really. Um, one just on process. Um, 20 odd authors, it made you realize that herding cats is just about possible. Um, I, I didn't envy Isaac when he agreed to take on this as a lead. It was something I was, I, I would, I, I thought I'd never do, and I'm still not 100% certain I'd ever do again, but it was much, much better than I expected, um, but still hugely challenging. Um, but maybe that's you know, hugely challenging things out of that come, come interesting outputs. In terms of the, the content, I mean, I, I just echo what a lot of people have said here. But something that did play out for me, and it's just seeing the paper in the wider context of how I interpret the climate change environment in an industrialized, relatively wealthy nation, or in even the group of nations within the EU, which we're part of, and obviously most trips to Sweden. And that is actually, I don't want it to be unreasonably or hopeful, but hopefully substantiatedly hopeful, is this idea that civil society is absolutely key. Amongst the elites, and in the elites I include academia, the heads of NGOs, and all the, all the rest of them. But I think we often dismiss the usual suspects, as we derogatively call them in the UK anyway. And you start to realise that it's the new dialogues, dialogues, not you know, the plural, are coming out of messy partnerships of all sorts of ragtag groups of one sort or another. A very sort of emergent process that we often just dismiss but that actually is where if any leadership that is breaking down the, the power structures that are there to sit, to maintain the status quo it's coming out of that messy processes and um, in whatever form and actually i think recognizing that and the paper helped me think that through and helped me appreciate that and actually re, re situate myself is that i now am much more engaged interested in engaging with those groups than i am with some of the conventional elites and when I say elites, let's not pretend they're not just the ones who fly to Davos in jet, in jet planes. They're the senior academics who like brown nosing and being sycophants and being at the dinners and prestige, that like all that aspect of things. They're senior people in NGOs and journalists and businesses. So it's not just some sort of group way out there. They're actually people we spend a lot of time with, and they may even be ourselves sometimes. And that also, I think it's important to reflect upon. So to me, that's what I found really helpful with the paper was to actually look for this avenue of chance where we can have open up the dialogues and I think some of the early career researchers are starting to work with that in the enabler cluster the ones that are trying to provide the research to underpin these new alternative complementary of um, conflicting sometimes visions of the future but let's not underplay that the status quo is phenomenally powerful may not be many of them but it is phenomenally powerful trying to counter um, any new dialogues any new discussion any new avenues of research so it was it was upbeat and downbeat in the same paper I feel Thank you, Kevin. Um, I think that was everyone. If, if I missed somebody, uh, please let me know and just <laughs> take the floor. Uh, that was part of writing the paper, but that has, hasn't been able to share the reflection so far. But I think, um, I think now the plan is basically to open up for questions and discussion. I see that in the chat, there's already been a few questions that have been formulated. One directly to Peter. So maybe we can start with that one. If, and then in the meantime, I guess others can uh, pose questions in the chat or also raise your hand if you want to pose a question live. I guess that's the way we'll do things. Um, and uh, yeah, but maybe we'll start with the question from Kevin Noon to, um, to Peter Newell. Uh, have you had a chance to read that, Peter? 
I'm reading it as you're speaking. <laughs> yeah. so I, can read, I can react quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the things you're saying there around, yes, the military often has a cogent analysis of the threats, um, sometimes seem to be ahead of the game. And of course, yeah, that's what they have to do, right? They're trying to manage and anticipate and intervene, and they have the resources in the infrastructures and the arms to do just that. So yeah, I guess it's unsurprising that they have good intelligence and they're able to build scenarios and models and so on. Um, and, you know, potentially that can be useful and can be engaged with. Um, but I am worried also, though, about some of the discourses coming out of, of the military establishment in relation to climate change, um, sometimes quite reductionist around climate wars, um, sometimes with very real consequences for poorer people where they predict what the, you know, the impacts will be in certain areas around, you know, sea level rise or lack of access to um, fertile land, and that can lead to interventions which force displacement, which can actually lead to dispossession of groups of one sort or another. And that's to say nothing of the sort of resource and land grabbing role that, that militaries can, can also play. So I, they have a, a problematic relationship, in my view, uh, in, in relation to, to trying to address climate change and often get used, come back to what Kevin was just saying, by elites to protect themselves and i think we're seeing this was a, a report from uh, the transnational institute that just came out i think on this looking at how militaries are being used to police borders and to manage migration and climate refugees increasingly that's one of their roles is to protect infrastructures and wealthier groups in society from the inevitable disruption that climate change is causing and, and so they're playing that you know more aggressive role potentially and in a way the whole the whole mindset the sort of zero sum mentality is not conducive and not helpful to trying to build more inclusive socially just solutions so i do have i do have some um concerns about that so of course we have to engage with military actors of course they have something to contribute in terms of analysis and understanding um but I'm wary slightly of, of the overall, you know, the ways in which they can use power and the ways in which they think about the world are not ways that I think um, I would embrace if we're serious about just transitions. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think we'll, because I don't see any other hands at the moment, uh, I think we will go to uh, Kevin's second question, which was a question for anyone. So anyone's free to chip in here. Um, he says, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Donella Meadows' writings about leverage points. What are the most, or I know that Isak is, which I am, but if anybody else is, uh, I guess the question would be then, what are the most effective leverage points you see through the, not these nine lenses? So anybody would like to jump in and respond to that? I'm happy to say something. I'll put my hand up there. He's happy to say something. Yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, I almost want to step away from that and say, without trying to deliberately avoid the question, I think looking for the most effective lenses is possibly a mistake. Because it, it I mean, I know, I know Kevin won't be mean it like this, but it sounds slightly reductionist that some of the, that some lenses are going to be, or some levers rather, are going to be much better than others. And well, maybe they are, but I don't think we can know that. And that's my sense of this. It's too emergent for us to know that. We like to think we can, particularly as academics, reductionist academics, we love the idea that we can, we can discern which is the most appropriate lever. Well, I, I think that in, with, when things get this sort of complex in systems, you can't. So my, my take on that is choose two levers, maybe more than that if you want to, one you're familiar with and one you're uncomfortable with. Um, and so for me, I'm familiar with critiquing usually numerically the nonsense that comes out of governments and a lot of established academic institutions who are just just a sort of a handmaiden of governments or handmaid of government or a hand servant of government um but uncomfortably i'm trying to engage much more with some of the ngos and people that glue themselves to roads and all the other things that i socially feel uncomfortable with but actually i think probably they are making more useful contribution to the debate than, than many people like me who you know, write papers and so forth so that's my uncomfortable lever engaging with those people the best i can to offer my help and services if it's useful um, and also critiquing the others but just choosing the levers that are familiar and uncomfortable whatever they may be thanks kevin anyone else want to chip in from our broad set of co-authors can you see our hands or isaac yeah now i can see it i see two hands yes go ahead clive okay 
Thanks. Yeah, I, I would say that there, basically there's multiple mechanisms is what I was saying earlier, right? So any one individual cannot address all the multiple mechanisms. That would be bizarre. But what you can do is you can be aware that there are multiple mechanisms and support across the board. And this is the key thing, right? So if you say, what are the key leverage points? Well, it depends what you're trying to achieve, what context you're in, which country you're in. You know, if I'm trying to get rid of carbon emissions at the local level in my neighborhood, that's totally different than trying to do something at the multinational level. Uh, am I trying to address the corporations? Uh, am I trying to stop um, you know, individual behavior and make people more aware? There's lots of different things going on here. And it's not a matter of, uh, of identifying a single leverage point or a, or a group of leverage points, I would say. It's really a matter of you know, carbon and fossil fuels are throughout the economy. For me, I'm, a, I'm an economist, right? So I'm a trained economist. So for me, of course, one of the things is to deconstruct and change economics because it's an extremely powerful rhetorical device. It's not a science. It should be a science, but it's not. And that's the, that's the key thing for me, right? But I also am an activist. Uh, and I think that all academics should be activists if they have any sense of, uh, of injustice about the world and what's going on, right? I think they have a moral duty to do it, and many of them don't. Writing papers and sticking them in a journal, I think, is irresponsible if you don't then follow up on what it tells you about the world. So, you know, we all have different roles to play, and being politically active, protesting, being a person who may, maybe, Kevin, you don't stick your hand on the road, but you can still walk down the street with the other guys, you know, and I'm sure you do. And we all, we all can do many different things, right? We, yeah, okay, I agree with Kevin. We don't know the leverage points that might work, or we don't know the mechanisms that might actually succeed, but we know a lot. And I, I don't think we, we know nothing, right? That's the whole point. We, we analyze and look at structure. And it's not just an academic thing. This is the other thing I would say. Every activist on the street thinks they know something about what will cause a change. And that's why they're on the street, because otherwise it'd be pointless being on the street if they didn't think it was going to contribute something. So, you know, I think everybody is concerned and they also think that, well, maybe this will help. Maybe this will be the thing that will change something. And maybe sometimes it does. Thanks, Clive. I, I know that Svetlana has raised her hand earlier or, or noted that she wants to ask a question. So I'll pass over to her just very quickly uh, or soon. Uh, but I also saw that Peter had maybe a response as well. Would you like to say something, Peter, or was that an old hand you had? Yeah, I was just going to chip in on this discussion about leverage points. I mean, I agree with what um, others have said um, that really, I guess the moment we're in now, we need to try all of the leverage points. But but it's also the case that all of us have different leverage points, depending on who we are in terms of, you know, class and status, and race, and gender and other things, but also where in the world we live. So the sorts of levers we have access to are different. And, you know, I think come back to Kevin's thing. I think we can't always be sure what effects they will have until we try it. Um, and we're in such a desperate moment now. I think we have to try all sorts of um, levers. Um, but I think also it's important to think about the different spaces we occupy. And I'm thinking back to sort of some of the work we're doing on behaviour change before. People often tend to think about individual consumption choices as an individual or within a household. But yet then, you know, we're, most of us, hopefully, or a lot of people get are employed as well. So there's an opportunity within the workspace to try and do things differently. You're often hopefully also part of some sort of community and then broader political society. And all of those spaces bring opportunities and different leverage points um, that we can try and mobilise. So sometimes I think academic discussions are unhelpful because we all focus in on the one lever that we know most about. And we think that's the theory of change. Um, but of course, we all move between these different spaces and have different access to power. Um, so I think our, our theories need to be a bit more nuanced there. But I also think Clive's right that people make decisions on the basis of their theory of change and, and they wouldn't be there without that. Thanks, Peter. So I think we'll, I see that Frederick has his hand up, but I think I will pass over to Svetlana first. Would you like to ask a question? Yes, thank you so much, Isak, and thank you everyone for the great article. And actually, Peter was halfway answering my question already. Um, because this is um, a fantastic uh, example of interdisciplinary or superdisciplinary work. Um, but also something that I'm reflecting upon is that the perspectives that are presented in the article, they are um, almost mainstream in some disciplines, um, political science or towards the humanities, but um, they're very marginal in, for example, uh, disciplines of economic um, sciences. Um, so. I'm thinking if you want, I'm a PhD student at the moment, so I, I think I need the strategies to, to make these things more uh, mainstream in even in economic sciences. So if you sort of have any reflections on how to bring 
power perspectives and um, practice-based perspectives, as, as um, I think um, Professor Splash was um, um, sort of underlining, uh, into, um, into the fields where this is still, like this discussion is still about green growth, is about win-win solutions and, and all that language. Thank you so much. Anybody want to chip in? Maybe Frederick, do you have anything to say in response to that, or, or did you have another point? Um, yes. Uh, well, green growth is not anecdotal. I mean, I see it from a political level, at like EU level. Uh, green growth is a political agenda, a very specific one uh, that goes in the face of uh, what we know about the country. So this is not anecdotal. This is not about economics. This is about power relations and politics in my personal experience. And more broadly to the former question about the leverage points. I mean, I would say that the conclusion of the, of the paper about the role of power provides some cues by itself um, that each of us is uh, you know, free to interpret as they will, but that should be very informative of theories of change. And it reminds me of a, sent a statement from Jean-Claude Juncker a few years ago, who said, the only thing that changes my policies if is if I see 1 million people in the street. And also there's the whole history of uh, you know, civil rights. So there's, you know, it kind of sort of corroborates a historical uh, trend in my, in my opinion. Um, Clyde, would you like to jump in also? See your hand. Yeah, I just on this point about, I mean, are we talking about the academy here? You know, what we're, what we're talking about in terms of trying to create change. If, you know, in economics, economics is a very dominant uh, orthodoxy. And there is a heterodoxy as well, right, which is diverse. And the, the thing is that who controls the economics departments and why are they particularly the way they are? Uh, and, you know, I, I have a master's program that I'm in charge of. We train people, they come out, we've got, you know, hopefully 60 people a year. And what do they do when they come out, right? They go into a structure which doesn't allow them to be the free thinking people they want to be. They cannot get tenure, they can't get a job, they have precarious employment. They go into NGOs, they can't get into an economics department, maybe they have to find a different department. This is the state of academia, right? It's a battleground. Uh, and in, in terms of economics and what's going on in economics, this is a fight, right? So uh, there's a continual struggle here to basically be recognized. You know, people are always trying to make me out not to be an economist because of what I write and what I do. Well, bad luck, guys, because I'm ranked number, you know, in the top 5% of economists because I publish. And, you know, but for younger people, that's not the case. They, the younger academics coming out have got the big struggle ahead of them. You know, we've tried to do things like in Europe, setting up people, the economic society, trying to set up support for younger academics, set up summer schools, doing all sorts of things across the board to try to break this uh, and some success, right? You know, and getting journals set up, but it's a continuous struggle. So the, the journals get invaded by the mainstream when they're successful. The departments get taken over by mainstream economists. The environmental neoclassical economists come in and take over. Uh, they ignore what you write because they can. The press does nothing because it's a power game in terms of the press and the financial elite, when, as Fred and I have been working on, you know, the growth machine, the financialization, the commodification. But so this is the struggle. It's a continuous fight. It's not as straightforward to take over or throw out the uh, economics uh, people. But, but it, it's worth uh, pursuing it. And it's not something you necessarily will fail at. You can succeed. I think we have succeeded in many areas, you know. Thanks, Clive. We have uh, Martin, I see here. Well. Yes, good. Thank you, Kevin. And also Iris uh, for good questions in the chat. Uh, so my response to the leverage points, I think this is an extremely important discussion. And I think we, as academics, should be brave and try out experiments and, and think about this really hard because um, we know that we need to move fast with uh, a big transformation. And um, for me, it seems that the, the power issue uh, in history, uh, at least, has been connected to uh, what is expect, uh, accepted and also kind of, um, put into laws and uh, questions that the 
the, the, the society police in that sense. And for me, I think ideas of end ecocide law, for example, uh, having the possibility of being prosecuted for destro destroying large ecosystem at the International Court in Hague might be such big leverage point that would actually change the morals of uh, the global economy and the, the morals of those um, subjects who are performing and the, the structures and, and what the society's goal should be in that sense. Um, the other thing I think to um, balance out the power of the fossil fuel industry and the energy in this industry is the number of people. And I think it is, uh, I know that you are one of the great leaders in Fridays for Futures. And uh, I think that Fridays for Futures has made such a huge difference. And the numbers in people getting together on this might be able to balance out the power from, from those energy corporations that actually now is burning the, the planet. So those two things, um, and ecocide law to criminalize large scale environmental destruction and the, uh, the numbers of people coming together on this, I think is two big leverage points that we can uh, think about and experiment with. Thanks, thanks, Martin. Um, I think, uh, Guy, would you like to read your question? Yep, if I can remember it. Yeah, so, I mean, as far as I can see it, there are multiple leverage points that we can see in, and wouldn't have already been discussed uh, thus far, but then there are perhaps some which are perhaps harder to access when you're dealing with maybe with countries with uh, authoritarian regimes uh, or just have very um, yeah, deep vested interests in their own natural resource endowments that happen to be fossil fuels. And then outside of like economic sanctions and we don't really have a body of governance with sufficient teeth to be able to impose um, strict laws at the moment on these, on these countries. I don't, don't know if any of the panelists have any ideas of other forms of leverage points that could potentially ramp up the pressure and ramp up the climate ambition of these countries. Um, even if all other leverage points are particularly um, are achieved, what do we do about these kind of calcul calculated laggards? Sorry for the tough question. Anyone want to have a go at that? <laughs> Kevin? I can't say, I'm, a, no, I'm not going to know. I can't say too much about this because it's an ongoing bit of work. Um, and okay, it's typical academics mucking around with numbers and spreadsheets, but we've been asked to look at this by uh, an organization, a, a charity organization, which will remain nameless for now. And what they've asked us to do is basically do the same work that Isaac and I did previously on our sort of carbon budget analysis and say, well, if you had to split the carbon budgets amongst producers of fossil fuels, how would you split it up? To which nations would you give, an, um, give the allowance of production within the fossil fuel curve? So that actually process is quite interesting. I mean, it wasn't one that we came up with doing. We think it's some legitimacy to, to do it to this approach. Um, but what it does, from what we're trying to bring the equity elements in and so forth, it tends to squeeze it. Well, one of the, one of the ways of looking at it, it squeezes out production of fossil fuels from industrial countries, industrialized countries much earlier than from poor countries, because the revenue of quite a few of the poor countries, particularly for um, oil, the revenue from those countries is actually quite an important part of their GDP, even after a lot of it is siphoned away in one sort, one way or another. But there, so we're looking at the, the proportion of GDP that is dependent upon the income from fossil fuels. And if that's very high, you can't suddenly just sort of shut that down because that, that funds a lot of the other things in their society. But if you go to Norway, the UK, the US, the proportion of our GDP that's dependent upon fossil fuels is almost nothing. You know, it's just a percent or two. And so we're starting to ask those questions in terms of staying within a budget about who actually should be permitted to produce. Um, okay, it's all high level academic work. It's supposed to inform NGOs that are hopefully then gonna try and push for early closure of fossil fuels amongst industrialized countries. But that, that in part, I think, plays into what, um, to what Guy is talking about, unless I completely misunderstood him. See you, Claire. 
think this is slightly different to what other people have been talking about when we're talking about leverage points. But one thing for me that stood out from doing this, this paper, and obviously the reflections we make in this paper is about inclusion. And I think what one trick we're missing is, is really thinking about how we get more people with different voices, different perspectives, different experiences involved in both activism, but also in policy making processes. You know, it, it, it requires a certain educational status, it requires a certain um, lifestyle commitment to actually end up in a position where you're in the, like, have the power to affect policy change. And I think until we actually think about more inclusive systems for policymaking, that's not necessarily about, you know, citizens assemblies or something like this, while they are also great. I think what we need to be thinking about is how do we empower a more diverse mix of people to be in positions of power themselves. Um, but it also it links, I think, in another way. So we, we've talked a bit about how how we measure success or how success is observed and how it's monitored and how we think about these things. And, you know, traditionally we've had economic metrics for thinking about success and going forwards, we might be thinking about other ways of thinking about success. But I think the more voices that come into this conversation, the more different ways we have articulating what successful climate transitions might look like that aren't just about emissions, but are also about creating better lives for people, or at least avoiding worse lives for lots of people, and starting to articulate those. And I think without taking quite seriously the idea of inclusion and thinking about both how we represent lots of different people that are involved in climate transitions and thinking about how we get lots of different people into positions of power that matter, then really, so yeah, I, get, I guess inclusion for me would be a key leverage point. Thank you. Claire, um, very good points. Um, Niklas. Uh, yeah, lots of good points here. Um, I was just thinking partly from the, 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 the work on the paper and also the, the, this conversation, I guess, on the power. I think one of the things that is just so strikingly clear is the power of terms and words and how I think you know, we as activists, but also I think not least academia has to be very aware of, of, of what's going on because I think we see that there's like a, almost like a law, right? A pattern, you, you come up with some term well-intended, it looks good and it gets, uh, you know, co-opted, hijacked, turned around and all of a sudden you're fighting what you were promoting a few, few years back. So we have, you know, nature-based solutions that's going to be huge in COP. Who could be against that? That's a, that's a, that's just another word for huge plantations and and clear cuts and and carbon trading and offsets. Uh, we have a new term now coming, making a twist on circular economy. Uh, the G20 even adopted through some sly tactics from Saudi Arabia and others, others in the north, uh, circular carbon economy, which is heavily promoted by PR firms behind the scenes, uh, which is basically taking carbon from the ground and turning it back into the ground through CCS and burning a whole lot in between. And, and so it goes, right? And green growth, of course, and we have, uh, we have uh, climate smart agriculture um, and even a lot of now things, I think, being turned around geoengineering to kind of sanitize this, this, this field, both solar geoengineering and carbon dioxide removals, enhanced natural upwelling, I heard about recently as a kind of twist on ocean fertilization or maybe not ocean fertilization, but, uh, you know, uh, dangerous stuff in the sea. So I think that just raising that, and of course, real zero, uh, net, net zero is, is, is going to be absolutely huge in the, in the next few, few weeks here. So we need to find ways here so we're not uh, getting surprised all the time, but also maybe being more clever. And I think that's something for academics as well to be kind of thinking about maybe because conceptualizing and creating new words is something that many of us and you are good at, I think. And, uh, and, and maybe think about also finding terms that it's hard to co-opt. So a very dear friend of mine, Pat Mooney, one of the most brilliant uh, prophetic thinkers I've, and, and, and activists I've ever known, he, he coined two terms that are, are, I think are just hard to beat, biopiracy. Uh, that one is hard to co-opt, right? And you just win the debate when you start getting everybody, including the enemies, the proponents to use it. <laughs> and likewise, terminator technology, these, uh, these uh, suicide seeds uh, that were promoted in a 
very sly way and and they, all of a sudden this this became the, the term that everybody uses and, and they kind of were were um tinted uh, uh, inherently um so i just wanted to raise those kinds of uh ideas maybe as we in a creative mode here but uh and, and we can have a competition to see who what is the next one <laughs> next popular for the book Thanks, uh, Nicholas. I think this ties quite nicely into some of the comments and some of the questions that have come in in the chat as well. Um, I'm thinking about sort of the, the I've been trying to follow the exchange here on, on the chat, sort of the responses coming uh, from our our panelists or our co-authors reflections on leverage points and also this this fact that, you know, that the focus on numbers and sort of the parameters might not be, you know, the most effective in terms of really uh, re structuring societies and sort of uh, responding uh, with, with more sort of, let's say, depth of analysis in, in sort of thinking about change. And also there's some questions uh, that have come in from, I guess, people involved in civil society movements like XR and Fridays for Future about sort of what are the key takeaways from this paper. And I think also actually Duncan's um, uh, question sort of connects uh, to this as well. And also Jennifer's question in terms of um, alternatives then. Uh, we don't, just to answer your question really quickly, Jennifer, we don't uh, in, we don't directly discuss sort of, um, we sort of saw as our main focus in this article to sort of look at the last 30 years uh, of, of failure to mitigate in a sense, but of course our critique also points in various directions, but it's it, it wasn't the sort of the main focus uh, to look at sort of alternatives, but I guess this conversation is heading in that direction as well. Uh, so. I guess I'll invite maybe, I think maybe Duncan's question. Would you like to pose your question? Because it's about the question of strategy as well, which connects to what Nicholas was saying as well. Would you like to share some, uh, share your question live? Sure, thank you. Um, and thanks very much for the, the paper and the presentation and, and discussion, um, all really important stuff. Um, I'm reminded though by the discussion about leverage of different strategies and all these different lenses of um, Eric Olin Wright's work on real utopias. And I'm sort of paraphrasing a bit, but he argues that if you've got entrenched power, then there, there may be three strategies of, of approaching it. One of which is revolution, which is tends to be a bad idea because entrenched power has money and guns and we don't. Um, reform buys into and is always too slow. So he comes down on what he calls sort of symbiotic or subversive strategies, um, things that where we introduce an idea that sounds like it's good for the elites, but will change behaviors, change requirements, set, re reset the way society works in ways that shift values. And an example that didn't go all the way as far as we would have liked, but the inclusion of women in the labor force in response to feminism in the 1960s meant that millions of men were exposed to working alongside women, not because they thought that, oh yeah, we've got to give equality, but because the elites thought this makes the economy more productive. So that's, that's as good an example, and it, it probably doesn't take us as far as we'd like. But in this space of, of climate, um, are there any sort of subversive strategies that uh, that our panelists can suggest? Well, so, I mean, I'm, I feel free that anybody can chip in here to this question. I think it's a great question, Duncan. I, I think one of the questions, I guess, that I have after having you know, spent a year and a half together with with all the co-authors here thinking about and 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 making this critique, and I, I guess this is, uh, in a sense, is also the limits of critique. And this kind of plays into your question as well, I think, in terms of sort of actually shaping uh, the direction of things, whether at the very local level or at the more international level. Um, and I think we also have to sort of think about um, this was discussed in Bergen at a conference I was at last week as well, sort of in the touches on what uh, um, um, Claire Hulewine was saying also in terms of inclusion, because I think also certain ways of framing problems, uh, you know, uh, attract certain forms of people in our societies and so forth. So sometimes I'm wondering also, 
uh, you know, is the is the best way to decrease emissions uh, to talk about decreasing emissions as quickly as possible? Or are there also other entry points uh, into that discussion? And I guess I'd be curious to hear from my co-authors if around that. It's sort of, sort of the, the 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 power of, of framing, I guess, as well. And and sort of there is a you know, there is an assumption underlying our paper also that if we frame this issue as a question of emissions over the last 30 years and why we haven't decreased emissions and why we haven't bent the global emissions curve, that will uh, lead to hopefully discussions that will start bringing down global emissions. But I, I'm you know sometimes. I think we also have to be a bit more strategic in thinking about this issue and also broader minded, I guess, in terms of, you know, what people actually care about um, on a day to day basis. So I'd be curious to hear other authors thoughts on this as well, or other people in the in the audience as well. I guess Kevin has raised his hand uh, and then, yeah, start with Kevin. I think Peter was before me, actually. I think I saw his hand. Okay, up. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Just sort of riffing off what you were just saying um, and uh, the question from Duncan, I think absolutely we need those different starting points, like start with where people are. I mean, a lot of the stuff I'm involved with locally, of course, I read it as being about climate change, but it's really about health, you know, like when you're trying to sort of stop people driving to school or leaving their cars running outside the school, it's really about air pollution, <laughs> um, as far as most people are concerned, but I'm also thinking it through a, a climate lens. So I think like well being, health, security, the basic, basic things that most people want are often more helpful entry points than sort of fetishizing carbon or decarbonization. I think that's absolutely right. But to sort of come back to Duncan's thing about like, you know, real utopias, I think it's a really good point. Um, it's very hard for people to imagine what an alternative might look like. It's very hard for most of us to imagine what, um, you know, a differently constituted economy might look like, what it might feel like, you know, what your high street might look like, because all the pressures are in the other way, right? The bombardment of advertising and the normalization of high energy and then high carbon lifestyles, et cetera, is so dominant. It's really hard to break through and say, you know, it doesn't actually have to be like this. You know, there isn't, there is another way. I'm a bit like, um, the, uh, the book from Transition Town, uh, Rob Hopkins, his book, you know, from what is to what if, can you actually sort of try and imagine what alternative ways of, you know, growing and um, uh, producing food or producing energy or sharing energy in a more cooperative way, just sort of basically challenging the idea that this is normal, that this way of living and being and organizing an economy is normal, given the massive problems and inequalities that it generates, as well as the climate crisis. So just trying to disrupt that set, that sort of notion of what the common sense notion of, of this being the end point of human ingenuity is a big is a big challenge, you know, and it's something we have to try and do in an everyday way across all of these spaces, I think. And, you know, yeah, Isaac, I think you're absolutely right to say different entry points are the way to do that, not making it always just about climate, but starting where people are about concerns around well-being, health, security, those sorts of things. Um, Kevin? Um, well, I agree really with what Peter was saying then. Um, I mean, climate change is one symptom along with other ecological crises of one sort or another. But they are also similarly symptoms. They've all got the different characteristics in terms of time frames and whatever else it might be. But then what are they a symptom of? And probably my simple interpretation of that actually is they are a symptom of, of how we've structured the world. And that way we've structured the world is very much the way that Clive, Frederick, Peter, and you know, others sort of captured that element of the, of the Davos cluster. But coming back then to... to um, to Duncan's point about sort of revolution, I think, well, but that's a very small group of people. So yeah, they're well armed, but there aren't many of them. And actually they're not the ones with the arms. You know, the ones with the arms are the people whose families are living in the normal houses, having to put up with the air pollution and their kids getting bonker problems because they fuel poverty and all the rest of it. So I think reminding ourselves that the majority actually have the power, the real trick of the small group with actually very little power is that they've made the rest of us think that we haven't got the power to drive change. Now, who is the we in this? And we're not in some neat form of coming together. I think, I think it's what Klein put in one of her, her climate change book, actually, is this idea that we, we have huge power, but we, we sort of disparate it's all over the place. If you could somehow, you could somehow coalesce it in some vague direction, then it would be very messy. Then it would be damn sight more powerful than the existing power structures. But the trick is to keep us as diverse and separate as possible so we don't realize we have it. So I think maybe there's a fourth dimension to Duncan's way of dealing with the, what we have today. That's just to recognize for what it is. 
a handful of rich, typically white, not always men, but not uncommonly, who have managed to make out the fact that they dominate everything and we all have to jump to their, to their calls. I'm not sure it has to be like that. I'm not sure all of us are doing that anyway. And I think we are getting many other people questioning it now. So maybe there is a scope for a sort of Czech velvet revolution. Um, so not too much utter chaos, not too many heads chopped off. Those one or two of mine seem rolling. Um, but I, I think there are other ways around this than, than perhaps the ones that we've thought about thus far. I think part of that comes out of us reminding ourselves that we have power. Um, but it's incumbent on us to take it as much as to be given it, if not more than to be given it. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, before um, I see uh, Clive has his hand up, but before handing over to you, I see that uh, me, Monica Schilt has a question or a comment to share. I wanted to, I, I realize I'm sticking my neck out here because I'm not a researcher, but I work with uh, what Martin Hultmann mentioned and Ecoside, which is a really powerful lever. And I think it's the Trojan horse that was mentioned earlier that you, know, you smuggle something in and it has far more power than you think it does. And what we're trying to do in terms of theory of change also, you know, partly accessing the leverage of what is the goal of the system, what, what are the values of the system, but we're also trying to look at where are the people who are at the forefront of change. Because at the moment, the, the system, the power system is, is serving the old fashioned people, but there are always people who are further ahead of the game. People like Niklas Sandström, for instance, who have realized that we need to change. So if we put the tool into the hands of the people who are further ahead of their thinking, they can help drive change. Thank you. Thank you, me. Um, Clive. Yeah, I, I was just, there's a few points here, right? So one is that a revolution, I think, needs to be understood in a broader way than just a bloody massacre. Uh, and you know we've got revolutions going on all the time in our lives. You know all the social media that didn't exist ten years ago, all the mobile phones. You know then they come smartphones and all this kind of thing. Uh, the way that our, our technology is changing our society continuously. I say ah, it's not my technology. You know, but you, you can try and resist it and try and avoid having a mobile phone. And then the structures actually make it impossible for you to live without it. Right. right? actually finally had to get an ordinary old fashioned mobile phone this summer because you can't get across Europe anymore. You can't book a train anymore. You know, this is the oppressive uh, regime that is in place that's being forcing you into a revolution, into a technological revolution. So, you know, there's revolutions that can occur. I, I like hanging out with people who are in the systems change, climate change, NGO movements, you know, because they already live different lives. They already think differently and they also already resist the system. And I think this is the another thing that uh, occurred to me when I think Peter was talking about the economy, right? The, the interesting thing is that there's been a denial that there are alternative economies. There isn't just one economy. There isn't even one form of capitalism. There are multiple forms of capitalism, multiple arrangements. You know, look at the size of the military that was discussed before. I mean, and Peter works on this. So, you know, the size of the military, the military is a planned system. What about the corporations? The corporations are central planning. They're centrally planned hierarchical organizations, right? Run by a, a bunch of oligarchic despots at the top. Th that's what they are, okay? Where's capitalism in this? These are alternative systems. And how far you let those corporations into your economy affects how the structure of your economy. And then what about the Sandinistas? What about the people uh, who are the farmers in India? They're not part of this system, they're resisting it. And what all the land grabbing that is going on against indigenous people, these people already live in alternative economies. Look at the, the billion people on your thin blue line in the very first figure. Those billion people, right? That's a substantive amount of the world's population. They're not in the system. They're living in an alternative economic system already. And if you want to have a really strong Trojan horse, then you've got to switch the economics to needs. Who can be against needs, right? Start thinking about the basic needs of, of the human race and switch the economics into social provisioning for meeting human needs. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Five, <laughs> for those words. Uh, refreshing. Um, Frederick, you had your hand up before. Did you want to add something to that? 
Um, yes, I just wanted to make a very basic point from what I see on the civil society front in Brussels, but and it links also with what was said earlier about the linguistics warfare dimension of our work, like all these new fluffy terms that come up and that are very vaguely defined about being co-opted, etc. And I see, or I believe in the value of an informed public debate that is crucially missing. And what we see, and I've worked on that with uh, uh, Clyde, is some, uh, there's beyond, you know, a lot of, for example, beyond GDP initiatives, well-being initiatives being promoted right now that are really um, promoting really the latest um, version of capitalism trying to re reinvent itself as purpose or stakeholder capitalism, etc. And my point here is that there's a lot of value in um, providing, uh, raising awareness about all these new terms and what they stand for and questioning the why. And what I see in the mainstream media, but not only is an undue focus on ambitions, the level of ambitions, but not enough questioning about the how. And, um, and so I strongly believe that at a very basic level, there's a lot more that can be done about contributing to an informed public debate. Thank you, uh, Frederick. I see um, that we we had said sort of, well, I told my co-authors that we would end by 5.30. Uh, I'm not sure what others are uh, expecting how long this conversation to last. I think it's been really interesting and fascinating, um, but I think we can, we can continue a little bit longer. We have another 10 minutes at least. Um, and I think um, there's quite a lot of uh, questions and comments that I haven't been able to capture here in the chat. Well, also listening in. But I think uh, one question that I think might be interesting to pose at this time was a question that Aaron had. Are you still there? Uh, would you like to um, share your question? Aaron oh, Thierry. Yeah, sure. sure. I, um, I mean, this was a little bit tongue in cheek, but I, I, what I wanted to ask was if in 1990, the same question had been set, um, would we have reached the same answer that it was power that was uh, hold, going to stop us from taking action? and through these particular nine mechanisms. Anyone want to try to have a go with that? No, oh, somebody's raised their hand. Uh, Martin. I might say something. Uh, among else, I'm an uh, environmental historian among us. and. Um, we know for sure that um, the knowledge uh, doesn't end um, at the beginning of 1990s. Um, we have a paper just out uh, about how the climate change uh, knowledge came into the party politics in Sweden during the 1970s. And uh, there we find explicitly that those who were in uh, favor of a nuclear power used um, the climate change knowledge to brush away um, the environmental movement who at that time were more towards wind power and small scale and transform the society. So that we know from the 1970s in Sweden. In the 1980s, um, <clears throat> we know that the oil companies had the knowledge already then and uh, that they were confronted uh, by this type of knowledge, uh, because up until then they have had research departments um, showing exactly what the climate scientists within the universities did a couple of years later on. And uh, the oil companies then, ExxonMobil and Total and others, there's a new paper out on Total by uh, Franta just recently, uh, they show that those type of energy companies changed from recognizing this um, because it was actually included in how they planned uh, their, um, uh, 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 mark th their expansion of fossil fuels at that time, how they changed and instead put in place um, what has been called the climate change denial machine. So yes, to my knowledge, uh, I would say that um, both the different types of, of uh, the nine lenses, as well as the conclusions, could actually, in some sense, hold also if this paper would have been written around 1990, 30 years ago.
Um, anybody else want to chip in here? Okay, I see another hand. Kevin. Yeah, um, I think that's a, I, don't, I don't think we can, we obviously can't know, but we can make some sort of guesses. And it's been about other things that were happening at the time. I mean, we did see, we've seen some significant shifts away from fossil fuels, temporary ones after oil price shocks. I think the 73, 74, in the late 70s, they were quite good examples. Um, in the US, what Carter tried to push through, which was then partly unraveled later by Reagan, was interesting. Um, so I think we, it would have depended on what other things happened around it. But I think we also have to bear in mind that the problem in 1990 was a completely different to the problem that we had today. And that's because of the cumulative nature of climate change. You know, if we had chosen, if, if Bush, Bush first, the Bush one, and um, and Thatcher and so forth had chosen to use technocratic tools that they were, were available to them to respond to climate change, the tools of the right, if you like, you know, weak regulations and light taxes, we could have actually seen quite a significant shift away from fossil fuels, but they chose not to. And I think probably they chose not to, that's what they might want to know much more about, because of a huge amount of lobbying and investment by the fossil fuel companies to undermine the credibility of the climate science. And I think that probably was very key in us actually not responding at a time when the responses wouldn't have been so challenging. Roll on three decades, we have almost no carbon budget left. And we move from having to make changes that would have been one, two, three percent per annum, technocratic adjustments, to something that is radical shift requiring massive government intervention and big social change. It's a, you know, we, we're not facing the same problem. They're given the same name. They're completely different things. Um, that's not a, a complete answer in any way, shape or form, but just saying the problem now in 2021 is not the same problem as it was in 1990. It is just orders of magnitude different, and I would argue more challenging. Um, and I think things happened the way they did happen, like a lot of the time, because of certain types of path dependency. You know, if the climate stuff had come along at the same time as another major oil price shock, with the prices of oil going up 400% as it did in 1973, then I think we probably would have responded quite differently on climate change, but it didn't. And so, it, you know, we respond at any point in history because of the things that are around us at that time. Thanks, Kevin. I see um, we have Mark has raised his hand. Would you like to, uh, we only have a few more minutes here before we're going to wrap up. So if you'd like to just maybe, uh, but I've seen you've commented quite a bit in the chat there. So feel free to share a reflection or, or a final uh, question. Thanks. Um, the one comment I'd like to come back on is, or the one, the one thing I'd like to urge academics, or I suppose fellow academics to do, is when you are on a stage at the invitation of a politician who is talking about science-based targets, and you know for a fact that the politician's government is not keeping to the science-based targets, tell the truth about that. So last week I was in uh, at the Greater Manchester Mayor's Summit and two years ago there was um, a great PR uh, triumph where politicians and scientists together agreed a carbon budget for Greater Manchester. The carbon budget is absolutely in tatters but no politician, no scientist explicitly called that out even though they were on the stage with the politicians and that's just one simple thing that academics could do they could tell the truth regardless of the consequences to their careers and their ability to get ref points via the political classes and i'll shut up now <laughs> thank you thank you mark um for almost at 5.30 here in Sweden. I don't know what time it is where everyone is in the world, uh, but I'd like to just thank everyone for all these questions and comments um, coming in. It's been really engaging and really uh, learned a lot actually from this, this session. And, and, and it seems like what we had in, envisaged with the paper to sort of spark a, a discussion around these issues, well, at least seems to have been uh, slightly successful in this small group. So hopefully it will, it will percolate into other rounds as well and other contexts. Um, but um, so thank you all for your questions. Sorry that we didn't get to go through all the questions or comments in the chat. I was trying to keep uh, keep track of them, but I probably missed some of them that, that would have been very relevant to discuss as well. 
Um, and thank you so much for all, all, to all my co-authors as well for, for joining uh, us today here. Um, I think I'll hand over to, to Toya. Uh, and I guess I should say also that the paper, for those of you who, who haven't already seen it or, or read it, is available uh, open access. Um, and we can, we can post, if so, well, I can try to post the link here in the, in the chat as well, um, simultaneously as I round this off. But uh, thank you, everyone. And I'll hand over to you, Toya, to, to sort of wrap this up.